From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. In this episode, we have a fresh take on the State of the Union address that happened last month. Every year, the president delivers a speech before Congress and the House chamber to address important issues facing the nation. It dates back to 1935 when Franklin Roosevelt first used the phrase State of the Union. And since then, it's become tradition that every member of Congress can invite one guest. Today on Straight Talk, we hear from guests of Oregon's congressional delegation who sat in the gallery for President Biden's speech on March 7th. Third District Democratic Congressman Earl Blumenauer invited Portland State University President Dr. Ann Cudd to be his guest. Dr. Cudd joined PSU last August. She is PSU's 11th president and only the second woman to hold that position. In announcing the invitation, Blumenauer said Dr. Cudd shares his belief that academic institutions and students play an important role in civic institutions and infrastructure and are uniquely situated to help engage in some of Portland's most pressing challenges. Fifth District Republican Representative Lori Chavez Dreamer invited Glenn Suconic to be her guest in D.C. Suconic is the behavioral health specialist for the City of Milwaukee Police Department, as well as the deputy director of the Clackamas County nonprofit Love One. Chavez Dreamer said Oregon continues to experience significant challenges in addressing mental health and addiction, and we need more people like Glenn to step up to the plate and assist those who are facing hardship in our communities. And from the 1st District, Democratic Representative Suzanne Bonamici invited John Epstein to join her. Together, John and his wife Jennifer advocate in Oregon and nationally for greater measures to protect youth from the harms of substance disorders and accidental overdoses. The Epsteins lost their teenage son, Cal, in 2020 after he purchased online and then took a counterfeit pill disguised as a legitimate pharmaceutical. The pill was made of fentanyl. The Epsteins helped pass a bill in Oregon requiring fentanyl education in schools, something eight other states have since passed. We will hear from our guests about their experience at the State of the Union, their takeaways from the speech, and more about their contributions to our community and their vision for the future. Welcome to my guests, PSU President Dr. Ann Cudd from the Milwaukee Police Department, Glenn Suconic, and Youth and Drug Awareness Advocates, John and Jennifer Epstein. Welcome everyone to Straight Talk. We have both sides of the aisle represented. It's so great to have you here. Thank you. Well, thank Thanks you. for having us. Yeah. Well, we'll talk a little bit about your experience first, and then we'll find out more about what you do and why you're invited. So let's begin with President Cudd. You've worked with, with Representative Blumenauer on education issues and on trying to revitalize Portland. What was it like for you to be his honored guest at the State of the Union? Well, it was really thrilling to be there at such a historic time and also to be such an, uh, to have such an honor to, to be there. But the theatrics involved all around uh, watching the president come in and watching all of the members of Congress greet him or uh, talk to him in some way or another. It, it was all really exciting watching the Supreme Court come in. So it was great. I also took the opportunity uh, to meet with uh, a number of uh, our uh, Oregon delegation to talk about what we're doing at PSU. And I was uh, lucky to meet with the, the senators from Oregon, um, Senator Wyden and Senator Merkley, uh, and also to meet Nancy Pelosi uh, while I was there. So it was really a, a great experience. And in the green room, you were saying that you met the Epsteins as well there. That's right. I met John Epstein. That's other right. other guests. Along with, uh, with Representative Bonamici. Well, Glenn, you were invited by Representative Lori Chavez Dreamer from the 5th District. What was it like for you to be there for that big event? Yeah, I was very honored to be there. Um, and it was, <clears throat> it was very humbling to be, uh, to be picked to go. And um, her and her team were amazing. Not to just show me what the State of the Union was about, but the inner workings of the office. And, and I was able to follow her around and be in some big meetings that just kind of made me realize just what goes on behind the scenes is not what we see outside and they're really busy. Um, I think I got like 20,000 steps in one day alone. Uh, so That's why they wear tennis shoes, yeah. the speakers to run around. <laughs> um, and I was uh, really humbled. They were really uh, hospitable, um, had some really uh, great food with some really great people, got to meet my wife's uh, 
representative from Omaha, Nebraska, um, Mr. Bacon. So it was pretty cool to just uh, be, be there and uh, get to talk about some of the things we're going to be working on in the future, like mental health and houselessness. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. And Epstein's. Uh, John and Jennifer, you have worked with Representative Bonamici from the 1st District on her bill trying to get fentanyl awareness education in our schools. But she could only take one guest to the State of the Union. How did you decide which of you got to go? You know, I think that was relatively easy for, for us. Uh, we do uh, different uh, aspects of our advocacy, and I work more with schools and interfacing agencies and uh, coalitions to try to get the word out. John does a lot of our data and works more on the legislative side. And, you know, it just made sense. He was uh, Rep. Bonamici's contact on this project, and also, he has a family connection to the, to the Senate, and it just felt like a natural um, fit for him to go. So what was it like, John? Well, it was an honor, for sure, to be there um, and to be recognized in that way. Um, more than that, it was exciting because it signaled to me that Representative Bonamici intends to actively work on the legislation that she has in this space. And um, while the, the, the ceremony um, was incredible, um, and walking through the halls of the Capitol was, was amazing. Um, I think what I was most inspired and enthusiastic about was how much work we did while I was there. Um, up and down the halls, meeting members, uh, trying to get members to sign on to the bill, um, meeting other guests and other members and introducing our work and hearing about theirs. Um, the work of the day surprised me and inspired me. So it wasn't just going to listen to the State of the Union. They, they put you to work. So let's find out more about what you all do, what your work is, how you got the attention of your congressional representative and got this honored invitation. And Dr. Cutt, as I mentioned, you have worked with Representative Blumenauer on education issues, trying to revitalize uh, the city of Portland. Help us understand what you're doing in far, as far as that goes, revitalizing Portland and the relationship between PSU, the city, and the congressional delegation. Yeah, and I think that the, um, the, the congressional delegation is really interested in the way in which we promote social and economic mobility from PSU, and so I talked a lot about that. But I think that um, our work, um, I, I was uh, fortunate to be on the governor's um, central city task force on revitalizing downtown Portland, and I think that's a really important role for PSU as we are you know, the largest landowner of da downtown Portland. Um, and Re Representative Blumenauer is also very interested in the revitalization of Portland and has worked with, uh, has worked for his entire career, really, on, um, uh, on issues related to, uh, to uh, economic and social mobility, re issues very related to the, to the diversity of our students and uh, to transportation and sustainability, other issues that are really top of mind for PSU. And he's retiring at the end of his term. He's done so much since he was elected in, in 1996. How would you say we're doing on revitalization since you mentioned you were on that task force? How much progress are we making? Right. Um, well, I think we're making progress for sure. Um, uh, you know, the, the biggest issues are houselessness and mm -hmm. drug addiction. Um, and, and those are issues that uh, we do research on and we help to, uh, to train a workforce that, that responds to that. But in terms of uh, our contribution, we're really focused on how we can help revitalize, bring people back, bring m more people to the arts and cultural destination uh, that downtown Portland is and, and that we can offer as well as our educational opportunities. So we're uh, excited to be to be working on um, uh, various um, placemaking and arts venue um, uh, destinations uh, for, for downtown Portland, which um, be happy to talk about, but perhaps I should let you move <laughs> well, on to another. Well, you mentioned behavioral health, addiction, houseless is something close to Glenn and your work. You're the behavioral health specialist with the Milwaukee Police Department. Yes. Tell us about your work and how you met Lori Chavez Dreamer. <clears throat> yeah, so yeah, um, I am the behavioral health <clears throat> specialist for the city of Milwaukee, and I started in uh, addiction counseling, so I've worked in the field for over six years in addiction counseling and then moved into the mental health world. Um, and I got connected to uh, Ms. Chavez Dreamer 
through Love One and the Father's Heart. Love One is a nonprofit in in uh, or in Clackamas County that works with our houseless population. And Father's Heart is the only day center that we have in Clackamas County, not a nighttime shelter because we don't have those yet in Clackamas. Um, and she held a community conversation with uh, some of the commissioners from Clackamas County, Love One, Father's Heart, state representative, and some other players at the field. There was somebody from Marion County too that came up. Um, and we just talked about tackling the opioid epidemic, houselessness, and mental health, which a lot of the times are together um, in the population that Love One serves and that I work with in Milwaukee. Um, so that was how we, we got together. And we're working on some common threads and really, uh, She's really passionate about coming together and building that community to work on this. And uh, I'm just so excited for it. Well, you have quite a story about how you became the behavioral health specialist. You have lived experience. Uh, tell us just a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I used meth for 21 years. Um, I've been in incarceration. I've been houselessness um, for years. And uh, you know, I continued my education. I went to school for almost seven years. Um, I got my master's degree at Portland State in social work, and I uh, majored in public leadership and community organizations. So it's really my uh, goal to get community partners to come together to tackle these big issues. Well, what a journey that you've been on. We're so glad to have you here, Glenn. Thank you. As we talk about your work, John and Jennifer, first from all of us, I know and, and here at KGW, we express our deepest condolences about the loss of Cal in 2020 and our admiration for your bravery and your courage in the work you're doing to try to save other youth and help other families avoid what you had to go through. First, tell us a little bit about Cal and, and what happened. Sure, well, uh, we have two, two sons. Uh, Miles is a year and a half older than Cal, and Cal was 18 um, at the end of 2020 when he came home from his first semester at university in Hawaii. Um, for, for the winter break. We were really looking forward to, um, to catching up with Cal, but uh, we didn't get the chance because he had only been home a short number of days. Um, he was scheduled for a, a COVID test and we noticed the car hadn't left. And so we went to check on him and found him unresponsive in his bed. Um, you know, first responders came and, and um, all, of the, all of the things that go with that. And we were able to get Cal to the hospital, um, but we weren't able to bring him home. Um, we found out that he had uh, later that he had purchased what he thought was an oxycodone pill online on social media uh, for a few dollars, um, thinking it was oxycodone, which we learned from his uh, search history and his on his computer. Um, but it turned out to be entirely made of fentanyl. Um, and this was um, this was a, a kid who didn't have a dependency or um, substance use disorder, as far as, as far as we know, and not that. Um, we, we sort of make that point not because um, we put Cal's situation in any way better or than anyone else. There's so many thousands we've lost. Um, it's just that so many families and young people um, aren't thinking about this new development in, in the overdose epidemic and how um, something deceptive in a, in a pill um, can take their lives uh, quickly. And so we, we sort of... Um, we make that point that Cal was, you know, kind of a normal, average kid, with lots of friends, um, well-adjusted, and um, um, didn't have a, a substance use disorder and, and experienced the harms of fentanyl uh, in a way that we didn't even know existed. Well, Jennifer, according to the nonprofit Song for Charlie, only two in five young Americans consider themselves knowledgeable about fentanyl. To your point mm -hmm. there, John, and, and Jennifer, you helped pass a bill requiring fentanyl education in schools. And you've got a new program that's about to launch the new drug talk, Connect to Protect Oregon. Tell us about that. Yes, the new drug talk is a program that was originally developed by Song for Chelly for the state of California with funds from the California Department of Healthcare Services. And it's a program that is intended to uh, educate parents and caregivers about fentanyl and how the drug landscape has changed since since they were a kid, help them to understand what is going on and to encourage them to have ongoing conversations about uh, uh, prescription pills, the dangers of prescription pills and mental health with their kids. And we know that young people, uh, whenever they understand the risk of a drug or, or anything, they're less likely to partake in it. And we think that the parents are 
are uh, an important part of the education that kids get. You know, we cannot depend just on schools or um, or on doctors or on social media to educate our kids. You know, a lot of this information needs to come from the parents, but the parents in many cases aren't equipped, don't, don't understand what's going on, um, and don't really know how to engage in productive or uh, I, sh I shouldn't say not, um, perhaps it's better to say they are not confident in how to engage in, in uh, conversations that will not be, um, that will open up the conversations, that will continue the conversations, not be judgmental, uh, and, and to have, have ongoing um, talks with their the and we should say that us. National Felton, Awar Felton Awareness Day is May 7th, mm -hmm. and there is a website you can check out uh, there on your screen now to find out more information. That's May 7th. And just briefly, John, you're working with Congresswoman Bonamici to develop her bipartisan bill, Fentanyl Awareness for Children and Teen Schools Act, or FACTS for short. The idea is to scale up and replicate the things that are working like in Oregon on the national scale. What's it like to be a part of that? Well, it's, it's really exciting because the bill is so targeted at exactly the small part of the larger crisis that we focus on, and that is um, naive, unsuspecting, um, unknowledgeable, uh, or lacking knowledge uh, young people in middle school and high school. Um, Representative Bonamici's act is thinking about the work that's been done in Oregon and in Beaverton School District in particular, um, where they've had great success uh, with their fake and fatal program and looking to scale that up by, um, by investing and funding pilot programs across the country that will uh, deliver that content to students, train teachers, ensure naloxone in schools and, and uh, collect data and some interagency task force and these kinds of things. But um, it's really very targeted at this part of the problem. And you know, the crisis is large and complex and very, very polarized in lots of ways. But the topic of um, educating kids and families um, about the risks of fentanyl coming in deceptive forms um, is actually very simple. And once you get airtime for it, once you talk to various members I spoke with, um, it becomes pretty simple and clear um, why we should do something like that. Let me bring Dr. Cut in too to talk about, we're talking about students, let's talk about college and what, uh, what the president had to say about colleges. And during his address, he, he mentioned Pell Grant. So let's, let's take a look at what he said. And I wanna make college more affordable, he said. Let's continue increasing Pell Grants for working and middle-class families and increase our record investments in HBCUs and Hispanic and minority-serving institutions. Now, HBCUs are historically black colleges and universities. Dr. Cud, PSU awards more Pell Grants to, than any other other college university in Oregon. What are you doing to try to make college more affordable? Yeah, well, we uh, do have a tuition-free degree program. So if uh, for in-state students in, in Oregon, if they're Pell eligible, they actually attend tuition-free. So that's one thing we're doing to make it more f affordable. We also have emergency fund grants and, and the like. And I think it's also important to uh, recognize um, that uh, student debt is uh, loan debt is is really a, a, a big problem and a problem that um, nationally w we have to face because uh, we we want all students to be able to attend college to be able to afford it and then not to be under a, a mountain of debt when they when they finish mm. and I appreciate President Biden's um, press uh, moves to to, to, to lower uh, student debt but I should also say that at PSU we're very proud to say that we have very low student debt for those students who um, graduate and, and go on. Um, we have among the lowest um, student debt in, in the state. Well, Dr. Cud, thank you. Thank you to our guests. We're going to take a break right now. When we come back, we'll ask our guests about their takeaways from the State of the Union, what impressed them most, and their hopes for the future, no matter who the next president is. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back to Straight Talk, I'm Laurel Porter. We are talking with community members who were VIPs at the President's State of the Union last month. They were invited by Oregon congressional representatives from both sides of the aisle. Dr. Ann Cudd, President of PSU, Glenn Sukonik, Behavioral Health Specialist with the Milwaukee Police Department, and John and Jennifer Epstein, youth advocates focusing on awareness about fentanyl and other fake pills. Welcome once again to Straight Talk. Thank you. Thank you. I want to just talk a little bit about the State of the Union, Glenn. You know, what, what was your takeaway? What we 
what do you take away from the speech and from the experience? Yeah, I, I really liked how uh, he talked about the effects of the pandemic on mental health because I see that daily in Milwaukee and, and how it just it has exacerbated mental health services. What I wish I would have saw more was more about the opioid uh, epidemic that we're in at the same time and and really the services on our houseless population and opioids so and dr cut i know you were focused on the pell grants college affordability is there something else that you're really focused on at psu that you'd like to hear more about from the president in the future well i think the president is doing a great job on on many fronts and and i think really what we're focused on right now is how we can help portland to to be revitalized and in that um, you may have heard that we just um, got this wonderful gift from uh, Jordan Schnitzer, who, who gave us a $10 million grant to uh, build out our School of Art, Art History, and Design. So we're excited about that. But we're also excited about a proposal that we have uh, with the city to uh, replace the Aging Keller Auditorium. And this proposal, uh, we think, would be a great way for us to keep the Broadway shows co coming to the Keller while we build a much more um, effective, efficient, um, and exciting venue that would, would serve the city. Um, we're, we're really focused on, on how we can serve the city in many ways. I think one other thing that uh, I would have um, liked to hear more about is how we can build the semiconductor industry even more mm -hmm. to, um, to, to build the economy of, of Oregon. And John, what about you? What, what's your takeaway from this speech? You know, well, certainly my heart was, was filled up with, uh, with thinking about all the other families that I was there in a way representing. Um, but honestly, it was, you know, the partisan politics were a little um, disappointing. Um, but the whole visit was a little bit representative of what I see generally in the landscape as, when it comes to the, the overdose crisis and the opioid epidemic in that to a person, every member I spoke with on both sides of the aisle, very earnest, constructive conversations with uh, Congresswoman Bonamici to contact each other's offices and work on it. Um, and so I felt very much like the, the spirit of doing the work was there. Once the cameras were rolling, you know, that, that didn't exist so much and it's pretty easy for things to, to get to sound bites and that sort of thing. So the speech, you know, it was, it, it was what it was. The work and the conversations I had with, uh, with the representative of her office and other members was really inspiring. And Jennifer, when we talk about hopes for the future, no matter who the next president is and, and does the next State of the Union speech, what is your hope for the future based on your area of interest? Yeah, you know, I, I feel like everyone in, in Oregon, most people in Oregon understand that the fentanyl crisis is is um, a major problem and the numbers are going in the wrong direction. I'm hopeful that by educating parents through the new drug talk, through the FACTS Act, uh, FACTS Act that we can change the numbers, we can bring the numbers down, uh, we can reduce the number of youth deaths as well as uh, reduce the number of people sliding into addiction. And I'm hopeful that um, with the, the new drug talk and which was funded by Trillium Healthcare, uh, and with the support that we get from our partners that we can make a, different in or, make a difference in Oregon. And Glenn, what about you? What's your hope for the future? Uh, yeah, my hope for the future is always more mental health services. Um, <clears throat> we really need you know, beds available, mental health and addiction wise, available when people are ready and when they need it and we really lack that in Oregon. So I'm hoping that we can all come together and ramp up services, work together and um, get through this all together as a community. And you um, have the nonprofit that you head up, right? Love mm -hmm. One. Can mm -hmm. people help by donating to that? Yes, they can go on uh, loveonecommunity.org and check out our website, um, look at some of the lovely things we do, uh, look at all the laundry and shower events we, we hold so people can wash their clothes. Oh. Let me bring Dr. Cut in finally. Mm -hmm. 30 seconds for you for a final mm -hmm. thought about, about your hope for the future. Yeah, well, you know, I'm really hopeful with these good people, John and Jennifer and Glenn, the work that they're doing to help uh, the addiction crisis and um, houselessness. And, uh, and, and my hope for the future is that Portland d is able to come out of this um, period much brighter, much mm -hmm. more revitalized, mm -hmm. and students um, happy to be downtown Portland.
I think we all hope for that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cudd, Glenn Suconic, Jennifer and John Epstein, thank you so much for being here, for sharing your experience, and for the good works you're doing to make our communities better. And we thank you so much for watching. Join me next week for a conversation with the new director of the Oregon Health Authority, Dr. Sejal Hathi. We'll see you next week for Straight Talk. Have a great week.